please stand for our national anthem. Sung for us by Hannah Jones of Hamilton High School. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star spangled Kurt Ellison, I have the great honor to be the convener of the City of Hamilton 1913 Flood Centennial Commemoration Committee, and I welcome you as we gather on a solemn anniversary to remember those who died, those who came to aid the distressed, those who enabled the recovery from this disaster and those who built the protection system that has secured us for a century. Before introducing our speakers in turn, I'd like to introduce each member of the platform party. We have with us today the Honorable Mark Mallory, Mayor of Cincinnati. The Honorable Ralph Hoop, Mayor of Glendale. The Honorable Richard Keebler, Mayor of Oxford. And joining us shortly, we hope, the Honorable Sally Hutton, Mayor of Richmond, Indiana. We have Jim Blunt, Hamilton historian. Kurt A. Reinhardt, Chief Engineer of the Miami Conservancy District. <laughs> Mr. Eddie Gilbert III from Fairwood Elementary School, and he's seated right here. <laughs> the Honorable Randy T. Rogers, Judge of the Butler County Probate Court, who is our host today. The Reverend Dr. John Lewis, pastor of the Presbyterian Church of Hamilton. The Reverend Dr. Peggy Garrison, pastor of the First United Methodist Church of Hamilton. I also want to pay tribute to our partners in Hamilton's 1913 flood commemoration events whose names are listed in the program which you received today. I hope you will read that program carefully and give them appropriate recognition because a committee of volunteers representing the agencies listed there has demonstrated excellent cooperation, generosity, and unparalleled community spirit quite well suited to the occasion we are remembering today. Many events in this two-month official commemoration period are yet to come. Please note these in the flyer that has been distributed and join us if you can. It's now my pleasure to call forward our speakers in turn. The first is Hamilton historian Jim Blunt, whose work and intellectual leadership here about the history of this community and the history of this flood is really the underlying motivation of everything we are doing 
100 years after this event. Jim? First, I'll allay your fears. I'm not going to give you a complete history of the flood. Uh, more appropriate, I think, is to talk about where we are in this uh, historic courthouse. Uh, it was 24 years old in March of 1913. And at this time, uh, there would have been quite a few people in this building, none probably to do any business in the courts or in the county offices, but escaping from the water because it was already rising. And there were people downtown uh, who feared the worst and looked for high places. And starting with this second floor where we are, uh, there were people for at least two days, possibly three days. Uh, eventually, without electricity, without water, without any heat, without any food, without any changed clothes, and a lot of fear. What happened here was first this floor and the third floor, a refuge for those people who, who couldn't get to their homes or back to their workplace. But very quickly, within a couple days, what was happening below us on the first floor was something that people of, of the 1913 era never forgot. Uh, the offices and the room where the county commissioners met was turned into a temporary morgue. Uh, there is no exact count of how many bodies passed through here. They all came in here unidentified. Uh, they were given a number, and then they were described in the newspapers by number, by gender, race, proximate age, condition of their teeth, scars, hair color, any other distinguishing marks. And about 10 days later, out of that morgue came a joint funeral for 49 people, nine of them who remained unidentified. The work on that first floor uh, was done by some Hamilton morticians, some Hamilton doctors, but the great body of work was from people who came from other communities, doctors, nurses, uh, medical students from the University of Cincinnati, uh, morticians from Cincinnati, and Cincinnati Sense Supplies. One of the pictures, and I'm always uh, kind of amazed when I see this picture because it's always reproduced very small from the flood. And as many of you know, there are hundreds of pictures of the flood here in Hamilton. It shows the empty wooden coffins on the courthouse lawn. And again, that's when I interviewed flood survivors over the years, uh, most of them gone uh, now, maybe all of them gone, that was one thing they talked about, was the sight of those coffins and what was happening on the first floor of this building. Just heard a story within the last week from a woman who told about uh, a family story. Uh, a teenage boy had, uh, of course, been dismissed from school early. And instead of staying home, he wanted to come downtown to watch the bridges wash away. Uh, after he saw the High Street Bridge collapse, he decided uh, he better get the high ground. And he started to his home, which I believe was on 7th Street, uh, it's about five blocks from here, and he decided he couldn't make it, so he came to this courthouse, to the second floor, and he spent uh, the remainder of that day, that night, uh, of course without food, and the next day, and near the end of that next day, which was a Wednesday, as he looked out the window, he saw a man in a rowboat and realized it was his uncle. Uh, called out to him, the uncle came, put him in a rowboat, and rode him home to 7th Street. Uh, that's the kind of things that were happening uh, in, in this building at that time. The family stories, of course, are numerous. I'm going to talk about those tomorrow night at Miami Hamilton. Um, one thing that, uh, even though I've lived in Hamilton all my life, uh, one thing I do not have, and I feel that uh, it's a real void in my life, I don't have any flood mud. Anybody here have flood mud? <laughs> yeah, uh, Kathy. Uh, I, I spoke to a group recently, and about a third of them had flood mud, a souvenir from the 1913 flood. 
As I say, I don't want to take your time with the full story of, of the uh, flood. Uh, we could talk about other buildings and other places and uh, other experiences, both sad and glad. Thank you very much. The flood was a calamity, a disaster, an event that attracted national attention, and the consequence, we are told by current scholars, of the nation's single most destructive weather event. In the wake of that event, community leaders throughout the Miami Valley, in Hamilton, Dayton, up and down the valley, came together first to provide relief to victims and then to make a vow that we wouldn't experience this again if we could change the river. Well, we're commemorating today the generous, cooperative, regional community spirit of those forebearers and the engineering achievement they produced, the Miami Conservancy District. I'd like to ask Kurt Reinhardt, Chief Engineer of the Miami Conservancy District, to come forward. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to share in today's commemoration and celebration. Um, just a few words, as he was saying, just before, it's really the reaction to what happened that I'm here to talk about for a little bit. Um, the worst devastation that uh, most people sadly ever had to face, the, the flood, loss of homes, loss of businesses, loss of family members. But the true story from our perspective is the spirit of the people and what they did about it. It wasn't just um, let's put our lives back together and go on as if nothing happened. It was this vow, we are never gonna let this happen again. And recognition that it's bigger than just Hamilton, just Dayton, or any of the cities, that is there a, a solution that benefits us all? And that's where um, the idea of the flood protection system in the Southwest Ohio and the formation of the Miami Conservancy District came from is looking at a, a larger watershed base to solve the problems for everyone. And there again, the spirit of the people in saying, we need to do this on a cooperative basis, but also having the faith in somebody that came up with, at the time, a fairly radical idea of using dams and levees in a system, something that had never been done before. But they said, this is a good plan, and they implemented it, and thankfully, it's worked very well. But because we have this regional system, regional co cooperation has continued. And so Hamilton today is still working with their neighbors in, in Middletown and Franklin and Dayton and Troy and other communities for this regional flood protection system. Out of that, we now have a regional um, aquifer preservation program that all the communities participate in to protect our groundwater. And all the communities up and down the river are looking at the river through our communities as economic development. So not only the system allowed our communities to grow over the past 100 years, looking forward, still hoping to help our communities grow. Um, so it, it's been a, a very successful experiment, and it's worked well. And we need to work together for it to work well in the future. So I think I'll close in saying we woke up this morning, we looked out, and late March, and there's snow on the ground. Uh, I think that's a general, gentle reminder that Mother Nature always wins. Um, we can't control that. How we prepare for that and how we respond to that is really the, the telling of the people, and, and I think that's a very good story. Thank you. Before I introduce our next speaker, I want to uh, thank the Franz Kleber Orchestra, members of that orchestra who are here with us today, and immediately after the next presentation, they're going to share with us some music from 1913, the anniversary song. Right now, 
I'm going to invite Eddie Gilbert III to come forward. He is a student at Fairwood Elementary School, and he has something to share with us called the 1913 Flood from a student's eyes. Come on up. March 25th, 1913 is a day I will never forget. This morning I arose from a warm bed and my mom fixed a great breakfast. She makes great pancakes with lots of butter. As I was ready to walk to school, she reminded me to wear my raincoat. It's been raining, even snowing at times, for several days. My mom said it could rain all day, and it rained as I walked for blocks to Madison School on 10th Street. The first hour of school was a routine, but things changed shortly after 10 o'clock. The principal, who seemed very and to be in a hurry, interrupted our class for a minute, having a brief but serious conversation with our teacher. Then our teacher did something unusual. She told us to get our coats and belongings out of the cloakroom and return to our seats. No one joked around. They followed her instructions. Everyone seemed to sense that this was a serious matter. When the last girl returned to her seats, the teacher said, it is important that you follow my instructions. There's no time to waste. There's no time for foolishness. Then she gave us directions and repeated them. She said, walk directly home. Tell your family the great Miami River will soon overflow. Tell them to immediately move to higher ground before the water gets too high. As you walk home, share the warning with everyone you see. You have an important responsibility. When we were dismissed, my friends and, my, and I followed her instructions. We hurried along and spread the suggestion about going to higher ground. Someone said, you mean run for the hills? Both my parents were home when I arrived. Dad had left work because the plant was closed due to rising water. Mom had gathered extra clothes for us to wear or carry and had packed some of her delicious cornbread. We didn't run for the hills, but we hurried. We walked east on High Street to a bridge over the canal. Dad said we should continue and climb to the top of High Street Hill. We were lucky because Dad knew a farmer who lived on top of the hill. We watched hundreds of other people make this steep climb, looking for a dry place in a family that would share its food. That restless night, as I tried to sleep, I thought of all the people we had met as we walk walked home from school. How many took our warning serious? How many actually ran or walked for the hills? How many thought we were just kids and were joking and had made up a scary story? Thank you. 
Judge Randy T. Rogers. Welcome to the uh, Butler County Courthouse. And uh, I'm just thinking, as I'm looking out over this crowd, you guys are going to be outside uh, today. <laughs> and I'm glad that this building is here. Um, also, uh, very appreciative of the uh, band there, but just a moment ago, as I was listening to that song, it was like a scene out of the Titanic, you know, with the rain out there and, and waltzing across this. But uh, today's a time of celebration because, yes, there was a flood, there was also a fire in this building, but, uh, you know, this building still stands. I'd like to uh, begin my remarks by making a, uh, reading a quote uh, from a, one of the uh, America's foremost authors, William Faulkner. And this is his description of a courthouse, and I've always felt that this uh, quote from um, a uh, play called Requiem for a Nun uh, fits this particular building. Above all, the courthouse, the center, the focus, the hub, sitting looming in the center of the county's circumference, like a single cloud in its ring of horizon, lay in its vast shadow to the uttermost rim of the horizon musing, brooding, symbolic, and ponderable, tall as a cloud, solid as, as a rock, dominating all, protector of the weak, judiciate and curb of the passions and lusts, repository and guardian of the aspirations and hopes. You know, Faulkner had a way with words, but his way with words in this particular play that he had written describes what this courthouse and courthouses throughout this state and throughout this nation represent. When this building was built, and in preparation for this uh, event today, the Records uh, Center, which is under the leadership of Butler County Commissioners, was able to locate the actual minute book from 1885 when they actually hand wrote the minutes as they did the business that uh, they went about in building this particular building. I want to share with you part of the um, actual specifications for the building that you're sitting in right now and standing in. Uh, this comes from an 1885 building contract. All foundations to be of concrete, composed of good hard stone, broken to the size of a hen's egg, none to be larger than when passed through a two inch, that would pass through a two inch ring, and clean, sharp sand, the exact proportions to be hereafter determined by the superintendent, depending upon quality of cement. Hard stone, broken to the size of a hen's egg, clean sand. To me, these historical references reflect some of the principles that came into reality that were acted out when the flood hit this place. You'll notice around the rotunda here, pictures. And those pictures, again, are a collaborative effort of the Records Center, the Historical Society, and the Probate Court. There's one picture that shows the cars that are parked on the courthouse lawn. Uh, there's another picture that shows the caskets that are stacked up on the courthouse lawn. Uh, there are other representations of newspaper articles. Uh, there's a reflection of what took place. But as I read the historical documents, as I look at the pictures, I'm, I'm, I'm amazed. I'm amazed at, at what people overcame back in those days. It was not a year ago we were in this same place, and we were commemorating the fact that a fire hit this courthouse, and yet that courthouse was back in operation before a flood could hit it within a year. And there was something about the people that lived in that time there was something about, and for me, the hard stone of the foundation of this building represents the determination and the perseverance that reflected people's attitudes. It reflected the way they responded to adversity. The fact that none of the stones were to be larger than a hen's egg reflects the fact that people had a certain humility about themselves. Uh, they were willing to work cooperatively. The Miami Conservancy is a cooperative and a collaborative effort. And there was something about our ancestors, there was something about the people that came before us that helped to build something that has lasted this long. 
The clean sand that's part of the foundation of the concrete that makes the footers of this particular building, according to the specifications in that 1885 contract, represents the selflessness and the sincerity of people's motives. I was reading one of the news articles, and I noted that, that there was a, a man named uh, Reuter who was a cashier at the bank, and someone else named Beeler who was an assistant cashier at the bank, and they volunteered their efforts, and they became the head of a rather gruesome task because this building did become the place where they brought the bodies. And these volunteers stepped up, E.G. Reuter and John M. Beeler, they stepped up and they headed up a volunteer effort to deal with all these corpses that had to be brought somewhere. And they were downstairs in that corner of the building. And these men and the ones that worked with them furnished their services, they used their own equipment, and they never charged a dime. How this community and the surrounding communities represented by the mayors of these various cities responded to a tragic, deadly event can serve as an inspiration to us today as we face our problems and as we face our issues. And my hope is that as we deal with our problems, we will use the same hard stone, hen's eggs, and clean sand. Again, the determination, the perseverance, the humility, the cooperative, collaborative efforts, sincerity of motives, and selflessness that the people of this community and surrounding communities utilized 100 years ago. I enjoy coming into this building and remembering those who came before me. They are a testament to the strength of this community, and they are an example by which we all could use as guidance for our own lives. Thank you for being here today. I invite you to take time to look at the pictures. I invite you to take time to read the articles. And I invite you to reminisce upon the selflessness and the determination and the courage of our ancestors. City of Hamilton is a community with strong leadership and that leadership is well informed by both its history and its vision of the future. Uh, no person represents that better than our mayor, the Honorable Pat Muller, and I'm pleased to call him forward at this time. Good afternoon, and welcome to Hamilton and Butler County. In an April 1913 letter from a Hamilton resident named Charles to his friend Mame, Charles wrote the following, water was within a foot of our ceiling, our porch gone, every downstairs window broken. The folks next to us came over by way of the attic window. Houses, horses, and drift of all kinds struck us. Hamilton was clearly devastated by the 1913 flood. Our neighboring communities showed up to help us, including Cincinnati, Glendale, Oxford, and Richmond. To quote the Hamilton Citizens Relief Committee President Ben Strauss in 1913, our touch of nature makes the whole world kin. We neighboring communities are kin, and we pledge mutual aid to each other. I'd ask Hamilton Vice Mayor Carla Fear and Councilmember Rob Wilde to please join me as we give proclamations to four neighboring cities that helped us so much 100 years ago. 
As stated, to show our thanks, we are going to be giving proclamations to each city, which I'd like to read at this time, then ask for each mayor. Mayor Mark Mallory of Cincinnati, Mayor Ralph Hoop of Glendale, Mayor Richard Keebler of Oxford, and Mayor Sally Hutton to, to say a few words to us. But now for the proclamation. Office of the Mayor, proclamation. Where the Great Miami River flood, as part of Ohio's greatest weather disaster, struck Hamilton, Ohio on Tuesday morning, March 25th, 1913. With the river in Hamilton rising from 4.8 feet to an all-time high of 34.6 feet. And whereas Hamilton's population in 1913 was approximately 35,279, and more than 10,000 people, nearly one out of three residents, were left homeless as water invaded 75% of the city's homes, factories, schools, stores, and Butler County's only hospital. And whereas deaths in Hamilton exceeded 200 within two days, and lingering complications resulted in many more victims. Among the victims were an unknown number of residents who died while trying to rescue or assist neighbors or strangers in distress. And whereas about 300 buildings were destroyed, another 2,000 damaged homes and structures had to be raised. All four Hamilton bridges were swept away. Utility, telephone, and telegraph lines across the river were cut. Flood water, as much as three miles wide the first day, divided the city. Travel and communications from and into the city were disrupted by washed out roads, railroads, and down telephone lines and telegraph lines. And whereas neighboring communities responded immediately with outstanding relief efforts coming from Cincinnati, Glendale, Oxford, and Richmond, who provided assistance with public works, shelter, food, clothing, safe drinking water, and medical attention for people who were forced out of their homes. And whereas students from the University of Cincinnati and Miami University in Oxford volunteered for various relief and recovery assignments, including the search for survivors, and students were deputized and assigned police duties with medical students assisting doctors. And whereas during the crisis, there are many heroes and unselfish acts coming from our neighboring communities. And Hamilton City Administration found an unselfish ally in Mayor Henry T. Hunt of Cincinnati, who a Hamilton newspaper said personally took command of the relief work and turned the energies of the entire city administration to this work. And whereas 100 years later, Hamilton has not forgotten the aid provided by Cincinnati, Glendale, Oxford, and Richmond. Now, therefore, be it resolved that on the centennial anniversary of the Great Miami River flood, the city of Hamilton extends its deep and sincere gratitude to these communities for their exemplary relief efforts in 1913. Some by myself as mayor and acknowledged by all members of council. How about a round of applause for these neighboring communities? Say a few words, please. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, first of all, let me say, as Mayor of the City of Cincinnati for the last eight years, this is the first time I've received a proclamation. Uh, <laughs> so I'm, I'm honored to, uh, to receive it. And I'm really honored to receive it for the reason that the City of Cincinnati is receiving this, uh, this proclamation and this recognition. Uh, as you look back on this event uh, that occurred in uh, 1913, uh, you realize that a lot was learned from it. Uh, the response, uh, the preparation, uh, a lot was learned in how you manage water systems, how you manage warning systems, how you utilize technology to keep this kind of thing from happening again. You learn to build buildings that are out of the floodplain, and you learn that uh, when rushing water is coming that you have to evacuate a lot sooner than maybe you realized in the past. So I applaud the uh, city of Hamilton for uh, realizing these issues and recovering from them. Uh, what we are reminded of in an event like this, though, is the response, the human response that needs to be in place. And I'm here today because the mayor of the city of Cincinnati understood that this is a community, a community that reaches all the way up here to Hamilton. In 1913, it would have been quite a trek to go from Cincinnati to Hamilton. Uh, but uh, people did it, 
People did it because this is a community where we look after each and every other person, and that's as it should be. So this event for me is a reminder that uh, in the preparation for disasters, whether they are natural or man-made, we have made dramatic improvements. Uh, in the response to those disasters, we have to be recommitted to this concept that we are all one large community. Thank you very much. Mayor Ralph Hoop from Glendale. Well, th thank you for having uh, me here this morning. That um, before I arrived, I was aware that there were historical ties between the village of Glendale and the uh, city of Hamilton, but I wasn't quite aware specifically what uh, relief had been provided from Glendale 100 years ago. And Mr. Blount uh, informed me just before the uh, ceremony started that there was a religious order in Glendale that uh, came to Hamilton and operated uh, a, uh, a center where meals were served and relief was provided for a number of weeks after the flood. And the uh, Sisters of the Transfiguration are still active in Glendale. They, they still play a very uh, central part in our village. So I will be sure to make sure that they are aware of the, uh, of the honor that you were providing to them in terms of the relief they, they provided before. As Mayor Mallory has said, that it really is a reminder of the way that people come together when there is a, a disaster or a moment of need. And uh, I think we all mutually can be proud of the way that we worked together 100 years ago. And I hope that would happen again if any occasion should arise in the future. So again, thank you for uh, inviting us to participate today. Mayor Richard Keebler from the city of Oxford. Thank you. I think one of the things that I'm struck with here today is how uh, I'm, I'm here today representing the citizens of Oxford, not the government of Oxford. And I think that it was so important then how the people of Hamilton, the people that were struck, it wasn't everybody sitting around waiting for the government to take care of them. It was a matter that they rose the occasion, that the neighbors, the farmers, I've read a number of the history uh, stories that have been written recently uh, in the Enquirer, the Hamilton Journal, uh, things that, that Jim Blount has put together. And, and it's just remarkable to me, he was telling me today that help came from as far away as supplies and things from Grand Rapids, Michigan. And people rose the occasion and people took care of people. And I think that's the important message about what was talked about here today that it, it wasn't the government that took care of them, it's the people that took care of them, and that's what neighbors are all about and still an important aspect of our country. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Sally Hutton from Richmond, Indiana. Again, I apologize for being late because of the detour, but I will say Ohio's roads were far better cleaned off than Indiana was, so <laughs> it worked out well. It is a pleasure to represent the citizens of Richmond and Wayne County. We have a very giving community that uh, works well whenever needed and even sometimes when not needed, but I think the, the idea of it is it's governments not doing it, that citizens do it, and that we all know that we are in a region, that we can't be on an island by ourselves. So the more that we all work together, uh, not just in disaster, but all the time, I know we always enjoy coming through Hamilton a couple times a year when we went to the beach water park and we couldn't wait to see what your summer event was going to be. So uh, I think if we all visit each other and get to know each other better, we're better prepared in time of need also. So we do thank Hamilton and um, appreciate it because I too have never had a proclamation. Thank you. <laughs> uh, one more round of applause for people helping people and mutual aid.
We're going to conclude our program today with reflections from two ministers who represent churches who were very much a presence in the 1913 flood. And immediately after the remarks of the second, I'll invite the Franz Kleber Orchestra to conclude the program. Please remain seated while they play the final music of the day. And now I'm happy to introduce the Reverend Dr. John Lewis, pastor of the Presbyterian Church of Hamilton, and following him, the Reverend Dr. Peggy Garrison, pastor of the First United Methodist Church of Hamilton. As we gather here this day to remember those who suffered so much, many of our congregation and just about every picture I've seen of the flood, uh, a certain portion of our church was uh, certainly covered by that. Uh, we gather here on this 100th anniversary to honor and remember those whose lives were lost and how our community was changed forever, and the bravery of the many who faced devastation and rose above it. We're encouraged by the words of the prophet Isaiah when God speaks through him to the people of Israel and says, but now this is what the Lord says. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Almighty and everlasting God, on this centennial anniversary, we pause to remember those who lost their homes, their businesses, and many family members and friends. We thank you for heroes who risked their lives to save family, friends, and even strangers. We thank you for neighboring communities who rose to the occasion, who traveled the miles to, came, to come and help and to be a friend to us here in Hamilton. We thank you for those who rose to the occasion and opened their homes and businesses to rescue those in need. We thank you that even in the face of tragedy, many did not lose their faith but clung to it. And we thank you for the bridges that were built from this tragic time, bridges of steel and concrete, and even bridges between heaven and earth. And so we ask that the same faith that brought our fellow Hamiltonians through this tragedy might inspire each of us as we face difficulties that will come our way. May the same fortitude that is instilled in them dwell in each of us. Let us never forget how our community was changed forever. And may we be blessed by you to go forward, honoring our past and building a future. We pray in your holy name. Amen. I was asked to speak a little bit about the role that First United Methodist, then the Methodist Episcopal Church of Hamilton played in the flood disaster. It started that uh, we are on the corner of Second and Ludlow, which means we would have had water around us. Dr. Milliken lived across the street, which was a good thing because when the waters receded enough, he and the Red Cross set up on our second floor in the Sunday school rooms a hospital because Mercy was still surrounded by water and people could only get there on rowboats. In that hospital, there were uh, between 35 and 50 surgeries a day to help with the recovery of Hamilton and the people of Hamilton. Then there were also 19 babies born in that church. So if anybody wants to say I was born in a church, some people actually were. I'd love to tell you about the building and let you go over and see the building but unfortunately, First United Methodist Church has been basically on that same spot for, since 1819 with four different buildings. The building that was there in 1913 burned down in 1924, and so many of our records were lost. However, I did see from the Ohio Wesleyan University some of the 
uh, publications of the church at that time. And the, in those publications, the district su superintendents were calling for people up from the river to come and give aid. First United Methodist was a place where people came to get clothing and goods brought in from Cincinnati and all other places. We could have fed people, but that was happening across the street, so we focused on what were our needs. So part of what I'm trying to suggest to you is, as everybody has said, it takes all of us together. In fact, First United Methodist opened its church doors so that people who could not worship in their own congregations could come over and worship at first. It has been a blessing to be a part of the recovery of the 1913 flood. Thank you, fair weather, and good day.